I'll go ahead and spotlight my video. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm Rabbi Michael Bernholtz at Temple Beth Shalom in Vero Beach, Florida, and I have been hosting this wonderful opportunity to learn together over the counting of the Omer, as we are in um, to this fifth week of the Omer, and I'll do the count of the Omer in just a couple of minutes. Um, as we are gathering each week, we've had different rabbis from the Central Conference American Rabbis who've come forward to teach different about different Jewish rituals, everything from mikvah to uh, brit milah to tzitzit and candle lighting. We are up to our fifth week, and we are very excited that we are getting this opportunity this week to talk about yard side and rituals of saying goodbye to those that we love. And we are joined this week, we are joined by Rabbi Estelle Mills, who um, it has been wonderful. Rabbi Mills and I finally met in person, but we have been Zoom buddies and teaching together for a number of years, starting out with the, right after the first to, uh, virtual Tikkun Leil Shavuot. Um, and so we are also joined um, in this endeavor today by Ra Rabbi Rebecca Dubo, Dubo, and she is in Bloomington in Illinois, and it is wonderful to have Rabbi Mills and Rabbi Dubo be able to share on this topic. Before we start, a couple of different notes. One is in the chat. I am going to post a, uh, a link in the chat for the playlist on YouTube if anybody would like to watch any of the sessions that were prior to this. Number one, Number two, today is, we are in, it is the 25th of May, so today is the 39th, <coughs> excuse me, the 39th day of the Omer, and so I offer the blessing, Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech Olam, Asher Kedshanu B'Mitzotah V'Tzivanu, Al Sefir Omer. Thank you, God, for giving us <coughs> opportunities to observe mitzvot, one of them being this counting of the Omer. Today is the 39th day, which is five weeks and four days in the county of the Omer. And then finally, as we gather here, I know that as soon as I started to see the messages, the postings about the school shooting in Texas, my heart broke. I, I Just this past Friday night was talking about the mass shooting in Buffalo, and I don't even know what to say. Um... But I felt like as we are gathering here as a community that we do need to stop and take a pause of silence to honor and offer kavod, some of our weight, some of our ruach and koach spirit and strength. Yet again, our tapestry of wit, far too many people's lives have been torn asunder. So I do invite you as we are watching this re most recent mass shooting, school shooting unfold, to take just a moment of silence. Adonai oz le'amo yitain, Adonai yivarech et amo v'shalom. In our brokenness, <coughs> in our pain, God give us courage and patience and strength, even as we gather here in a different way for a different reason to send our shalom, our sense of wholeness and harmony and peace, our sense of healing and light and love to those who are in need, as we say, amen. Amen. And so I welcome here into this space, and I don't know R Rabbi Dubo or Rabbi Mills, who is going first? Who am I spotlighting first? Um, well, I'm going to go first, but I'm going to share my screen, so I guess share for the whole time. So I guess if you spotlight the screen, that works. Um, and right, I'll go ahead then and share my screen. It's nice to be here with you today. Um, as um, Rabbi Bernhard shared this evening, this morning's subject is um, observance of yurt site. Um, and as I was doing more research on it um, to prepare, um, I was actually learned a lot myself as far as how the custom has evolved over time. And um, so I'll be starting um, 
we'll start with history and then rabbi, and then we'll, we'll move more into contemporary um, as we go on. But the um, actual observance of a year site is a ritual that's packed with a lot of emotion um, many times. Um, and so I thought we would also start with a brief ritual. Um, so I'm going to hopefully it'll work, play some um, background, um, hopefully not too loud. And if, if people want to just unmute and just say one name of someone that they remember and their relationship, um, just to kind of set the the mood of what why your site is such an important ritual. And Daddy, Baba Nita. I'll start. Um, I remember Stephen Mills, my beloved husband. I remember um, Carl Boshaw, my beloved brother. I re remember Ken Glansberg, my beloved husband. I remember Sherwin Jackson, my beloved mother. I remember Agatha K. Weiss, my beloved mother. I remember Edith Seidman, my beloved aunt. I remember Lucy Woodring, my beloved niece. on um thank you for those who shared um we'll begin with a little bit about the history of it um and observing your site is actually one of the most well-known and most widely observed of all of the rituals among judaism whether it's the very secular jews or it's the most religious it is a ritual that's observed by more Jews among the spectrum than just about any other religion. Um, and part of why it is, some people says, is because it's people trying to maintain a faith that the soul has not died, that there's immortality. And so they hold on to this ritual in hope in, of the immortality of the soul. Um, traditionally, as we'll see it evolved, um, it was originally only observed for one's parents or for famous individuals. Um, and then over time, it became extended to what um, are considered the other five close relatives in Judaism for whom mourning um, is part of one's obligation, namely a brother, sister, son, daughter, or spouse. And if anyone has questions that we're going through, the actual custom, like most of our customs has root in our, in our Bible. And the original custom came from a phrase, a um, passage out of Daniel chapter 10, verse three, um, that, which is down in the purple, that, um, that Daniel says, during those days, I went into mourning over Jerusalem for three weeks. I ate only plain and simple food, no seasoning or meat or wine. I neither bathed nor shaved until the three weeks were up. And Daniel's reacting to the um, destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And in his way of mourning, he stopped eating anything that were considered festive food. Um, and which is many times an actual reaction people get when they suffer a loss, that there's no appetite to want to eat. Um, and sometimes even some people have to force themselves to eat when there's been a sudden loss or very... Um, you know, a loss of someone very close. Um, so the original custom was actually just a custom where on the day when, right after someone dies and then it was then taken to on the yearly anniversary of when a loved one dies to not eat meat 
or um, or wine, which were considered um, in those days things of that connoted festivity. Um, by the time the second temple existed, it was built. Um, the, uh, this early custom of fasting on the anniversaries of the deaths of certain leaders um, was extended um, and it, to then those when one's parents died. And the anniversaries of the parents' deaths, just like after the temple was destroyed, people did not eat meat or wine. You also did not partake of meat or wine on the anniversary of your parents' death. Um, the mourner's cottage came in later, um, and um, the word actually Jurtzeit itself is from the German, meaning year's time. Um, but even though the actual name we give to this ritual is of, from German and from modern times, um, or more modern times, um, there was discussed what we need to do to commemorate the anniversary of a death as far back as Talmudic times. So the earliest mention we have of the custom, not again, not using the name Yurtzeit, which did not come into um, usage that term till much later, um, was a mention by Rashi in the Talmud. And um, he um, quotes a response um, um, from Talmud, you have a moat 122 that says, the anniversary of the death of a great man was established in his honor. And when that day arrives, all the scholars in the region should assemble and visit his grave with the ordinary people and hold a ceremony there. Um, so that's the first mention we have of visiting the cemetery and doing something to honor the anniversary of someone's death. The word Yurtzeit was actually um, not employed um, until later um, and from a relatively obscure rabbi, Isaac, um, who authored a book called the Book of Customs in the 16th century. Um, it was later um, uh, said again by another rabbi, Mordecai Jaffe, uh, around the same time. It's also the same word was used at the, um, was starting to become custom or be more normal usage by the German church at the exact same time to refer to its annual events, uh, commemorative events on um, the death. So whether we took it from the German church or they took it to us is debatable, but the term got used both within the German church and among Judaism at about the same time in the 16th century, the actual term you had ah, I don't know what screen share stopped. What is interesting is that there's such an emotional attachment to the term Yurtzeit and to the ritual that even though the term did not develop till the 16th century in Germany and the Sephardic community, which had not been influenced by the German community of the 16th century and had its own meaning for this ritual, of its own name for this ritual, they use the, the Hebrew Nahala, which means heritage or inheritance. But after the 20th century, the term Yurtzeit had such an emotional attachment to it that even the Sephardic Jewish community in its written literature started calling the custom Yurtzeit as well and not by the term that they had used prior to that. Um, what we do today was probably became a custom in Germany and around the 14th century. And then from Germany is where it spread to other regions. And one of the things I found interesting when I was looking into it is there was a custom that began around the 14th century in Germany and lasted really up till the 20th century where not only were um, the dates commemorated, um, but special memorial calendars were commissioned to keep track of when the date would fall each year because of, we observe it, of course, on the Hebrew date, not the English date, according to Halakha. And so these beautiful calendar pieces were commissioned with artwork. Um, and this is an example, one that's from the Jewish Museum's collection 
that talked about um, who died, what date, and continued and goes through the years. Um, to me, it, remind, it sounded very similar to what we now do with ketubas, wedding documents that used to just be a contract that got folded and put away. And now are these beautiful artistic pieces that we put on our walls. But there was for many, for several hundred years that the, um, the list of the dates became artistic pieces that are now found in many museums. So this is another example of one um, to the right on this slide. It's a lithograph from Germany in the beginning of the 20th century with beautiful color pictures and has the El Malay Rakamin prayer in it and some empty lines to fill in the name of the deceased and the date of the death. Um, and people would have commission to have these artistic renditions made. Um, these, uh, they were hand painted calendars. Um, and as I said, many of them have survived, or some have survived in our museum, Jewish museums. But what really came after that as we do get the Jewish printing houses, um, you have what this middle picture on this slide um, projects. And I have actually for my grandparents, for all four of my grandparents, a similar document to this middle document that the um, funeral home gave my parents, I believe that goes through like 40 or 50 years of when the yurt sites would be. Um, so it became um, where the funeral homes would give calendars. I don't know if any of you have calendars for parents or grandparents. Um, they were on pieces of cardboard, uh, but very hard cardboard to keep. So you'd have the dates. Again, this was before computers. Um, so that someone could have have a written document so they would never miss the date of the yurt site of when it fell on the English calendar. Um, obviously, today, because of computers, we have now moved. We there are interactive yurt site boards, and you can pay, and the date will computerized and automatically you can get emails sent, and there's a lot of ways to do it. So it's actually replaced not only the beautiful art work that was once used. And then these pr printing ones that were printed in mass by the funeral homes to now these virtual ones. Um, but a way, again, that makes sure that people do not miss the date of when they need to say cottage. Um, there are several different yurt sites that have become part of our contemporary Jewish calendar um, that the entire Jewish community supposedly observe or should observe the Yurt site for these people. Um, one is the seventh day of a, the Hebrew month of Adar, which is Moses's death. Um, well, another one was one that just happened last week, um, Lagba Omer, when um, in Israel, um, many very traditional Orthodox Hasidic Jews go um, to uh, Mount Moron to say, to observe the Yurt site of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai. Um, and then the third of Tishrei, um, which is also known as the Fast of Gedalia, which um, is the date that the, um, when Gedalia was removed from power as the governor of the, of the Jewish state um, in ancient times and dealing with the destruction of the, when the temple was basically destroyed. But that was the end of the puppet government and the end of the ancient state of Israel, empire of Israel. Um, in Hasidic communities today, they also continue um, the custom that the yurt sites of their respective leaders are commemorated communally. However, they've changed the focus from being a day of um, sadness to joyous time to celebrate the life of the deceased. Um, and in Israel, um, now that we do have a modern state of Israel, there are several um, yurt sites that have become national commemorations, namely that of Theodor Herzl, of the poet Chaim Nachum Bahalik, um, Rabbi Abraham Isaac Cook, and Zev Jadbatinsky, as well as the past presidents of the state of the modern state of Israel. Um, so with the um, yurt site, there are rituals that developed. As I said, the very first ritual um, was the um, fasting uh, or the abstaining from meat and wine. But it's developed now that there are actually five, um, depending on which stream of Judaism you observe, 
um, some of them have been elevated to the of being a commandment or a misquote that one is supposedly obligated to follow. Um, so to 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 observe a yurt site, um, the oldest and um, the only ritual um, that has been hinted at in the Talmud involves what I shared with you earlier, the restriction of food on drink. And as it was originally just meat and wine, then as we tend to make things more and more um, and offense to the Torah and bring them out even further, it became a complete restriction of food and drink on the day, anniversary of a day of a loss of a parent or of one of these great Jewish um, people. So in the Talmud, in the Hadarim, it is a passage that refers to someone taking an oath, swearing not to eat meat or to drink wine on the date of his father's death. And just like they do on the date that Gedalia was killed, uh, the fast of Gedalia, um, and as they do on the day when Jerusalem was ruined. So just as we fast on Tisha B'Av and we fast on the fast of Gedalia, the Talmud says there's someone else who said, I also will not eat. I will fast on the date of my father's death, because to me that is as much of a um, tragedy and something that I, I need to commemorate by not eating. Um, so it became again that we fast in the temple on these major events. Um, and then um, it was extended to fasting among the Orthodox on the date of the loss of a parent. Um, and went, went completely from not just eating meat and wine to absolutely not eating anything on the date of an anniversary of level, which if you think about many times, if it is someone very close each year as that date comes on, it's, it's maybe it's not a date that you necessarily want to eat and enjoy a fast. I mean, they enjoy a feast. It really seems to be more of a fast day. Why is my screening paused? Are you still able to see it? It says my screen is paused. Someone unmute and tell me if you can still my screen because mine says it's pause. Your audio is coming through. I'm having a network problem on my end, but I don't think it would impact you. But we can hear. Okay, well, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna start sharing it because I got a message that it was paused, and I don't know if that's true or not. So, okay, hopefully now it says I'm screen sharing it. If you guys missed slide, I'm sorry. I don't know when it paused. I just happened to see it now. Here you're fine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, the other mention of the fast um, is in the 13th century work um, that is dealing with um, when King Saul died. And it says that when King Saul died, David fasted. Now Saul was actually David's father-in-law, but David called him Avi, which means my father. So because it says in this book from the 13th century that when King Saul died, David fasted out of sadness, out of respect for the death. Um, therefore, it became custom that when anyone loses one's parent, it is appropriate to fast um, on the anniversary of the loss of a parent. And so fasting then becomes a way we honor the death of one's parent, um, which is understood today, according to Halakha, um, to be an obligation to the level of mitzvot among um, some Orthodox communities. Although reciting the Mourner's Kaddish is what we really think of when we say your site, that that's the date we recite the Mourner's Kaddish, and that is definitely the best known and the most emotional of the your site rituals we have. The Kaddish was not originally said on a your site. The Shulchan Aruch, which means the set table or law book that was written, codified in the 16th century, does not say the Kaddish is part of the experience for observing a yurt site. Um, and it only began around the time after the Shulchan Aruch was written. Um, um, and some of the reason why it was not said on the year anniversary um, is due to a superstition that some of you might be familiar with that you only say Kaddish for a parent up to 11 months rather than for the entire 12 months because only the true sinners need the full 12 months and you don't wanna give the impression that your parents need the full 12 months. 
So people, the, the d debate in the Shulchan Aruch is if we stop saying the Kaddish at 11 months, why do, then if we say it on the actual anniversary, then we're kind of giving the impression that our parents need that full year of Kaddish. However, there, um, that did change based on a midrash that described Rabbi Akiva encountering a dead man who could not rest until Rabbi Akiva had taught the dead man's son about Judaism. Um, and in this midrash, the son comes into the synagogue, Rabbi Akiva teaches him how to say the Kaddish, and then the father could be could go to, to rest feeling like his father, his son is continuing the tradition. Um, and so um, the idea with this Midrash is not that saying the Kaddish at 12 months at the anniversary is bringing one into the world to come because someone has already reached that point if they're a good person before the 12th month. But when Kaddish is recited, um, at this point, it's to, um, to out of the respect and memory, um, and not because it's necessarily needed for the full 12 months, but out of a way to keep them alive um, and for the, the children to continue the tradition. Um, and this change um, has been traced, and again, I'm a history buff, so I did a lot of on the history, to someone called the RE, who's a mystic, um, who taught that when you say Kaddish on a yurt site on the anniversary of one's death, and again, yurt site means year, year's time, um, it actually, a, it, it is not, as I said, aiding your parent to enter the world to come for, because they've already entered it, but it gives them a higher level in the world to come. So each year, as you say it, um, it's a way to then having some sort of continuation. Um, and at the same time, they changed it to a time of, that you remember with joy all the good things they brought to your lives. The third ritual dealing with your site, so um, on the anniversary of death, a traditional Jew would fast, would say Kaddish, and then as, as would be lighting the Yurtzeit candle. This tradition traces itself back to chapter 20, um, verse 27 of the book of Proverbs, which says the soul of man is the candle of God. And therefore the candle's flame and wick is supposedly symbolic of our soul and body. And the flickering of a candle has been said um, in, to, re um, to represent the fragility of life. Um, and remind us as we see the candle flickering of how important family is and how important it is to embrace our lives um, while we are living and to live so that the, our loved ones who have passed that our lives continue to be a blessing to their lives as they would want us to live. Um, but like anything else in Judaism, lighting the candle was initially very controversial. Some thought it was a very Christian practice and discouraged it at first. It did not become mainstream to light the Yurtzeit candle on the anniversary of one's death until the 17th century um, when this verse was connected by um, someone, a rabbi, Aaron Berechia, um, and he made the connection that we, it's not a Christian custom because we light candles on Shabbat, we light candles on Hanukkah, and um, candle lighting um, is done at joyous, happy occasions. And when we light candles on a yurt site, and this was moving into the Sephardic, I mean, to the um, Hasidic tradition that celebrating a yurt site should be looked at um, with some feel of joy that the person um, that we're keeping the memory alive and each year, as we say, remembering them, remembering the good things of that person. Um, we also associate with the candle, with the Shekhinah, God's divine presence, and the light and the idea that light enhances joy even more. So among Hasidic communities at this time, celebrating a Yurtzeit became a time um, that you remembered the joyous and the wonderful things of the person who had passed. And then the fourth custom um, that has become involved 
um, connected with observing a yurt site, um, and one that many of you might be familiar with because you get letters from your synagogue telling you that the yurt site is coming up, and it is a custom to then give sadaka in memory of your loved one. Um, and many times people do, um, so it is a, a mitzvah commandment, um, halakha now, that um, you should make a donation, whether it's to the synagogue or any other institution, on the yurt site of your loved ones. Um, and there is a more contemporary prayer that Rebecca found that one says when giving sadaka on the yurt site of a loved one. The prayer is, we are thankful for the gift of your life, for all that we have learned from you in life and in death, and for all that we will continue to learn. We donate Sadaka to blank in your memory. And through this act of righteous giving, we will carry on your name, and I would add, and your good works in this world. And then finally, the last um, custom with um, that you has become associated with observing at your site. It has become customary, if you are able to, to visit your loved one's grave on that day and to say memorial prayers, such as El Malay Rachamim um, and the Mourner's Kaddish and read some of the Book of Psalms. And some people also use the time um, to do a teaching on from the Mishnah um, on the anniversary of a loved one's death. And why the Mishnah? Um, it's the Mishnah because um, it's a word play on the words um, nishama, which means soul. And because Mishnah and nishama, soul and Mishnah come from the same root, it's considered you're getting close to the soul of your loved one when you study Mishnah on the day of their death. So many times there's a more modern, it's becoming more in vogue that when um, the period of Shloshim 30 days ends, you do a study session, but it's also traditional on the yurt site to do a study session and particularly from the Mishnah to remember your loved ones. So it's more to the concept, uh, although Kaddish is what we all know, there was actually more to observing a yurt site than just saying Kaddish. Um, and in, in fact, as a Kaddish it would develop much later than some of these other customs. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca who will share how we observe your site. Did you, hi, as you can see, there's a tremendous amount of information um, regarding the history and the rituals related to um, the yard site. So we're going to go on to the next screen. Um, I think, thank you, Sal. So they said that the shock on our work the 16th century code of Jewish law, as we've been hearing in the past um, hours, so that one should not grieve too much for the dead. Again, that you've been hearing the importance of the, to make that balance between joy and sorrow. However, there are several occasions each year when Jews memorialize the dead. The most significant of these is Yosite and the anniversary of the death according to the Hebrew calendar. So just site observance begins at night, just like all Jewish holidays and festivals. We always start the observance at night. And it is, as we know, it is constantly observed in memory of one's parents, siblings, spouses, and children. What you see on the right of the corner, of jumping ahead, but uh, some of you may ask, well, how do we know when um, we, um, how do we know when is the yard site date of our loved ones? And on the previous page, we, I, we included a link, but that's okay. But it says you can go on to the Reform Judaism uh, website and you will come across a calculator and say you will put in your loved one's date of death and then they can tell you what it coincides with the Hebrew date. So following the next slide, it says that in the reform process, the names of the dead are often recited in the synagogue on the Shabbat near the Yard site. Now, I know and recognize some synagogues do it the Shabbat after and some do it the Shabbat before. And I know that people often call my office and they, they just want to make sure that their loved ones' names are mentioned. And of course, there's the ongoing confusion and challenge because whether they're following the Hebrew date or um, the English secular date of the, um, of the death of their loved one. 
And of course, we would encourage the Hebrew date. But the reality is most people will probably go according to the secular date because it's easier to remember. So uh, again, the link was on the bottom explaining, you know, that there's a link to figure out when exactly um, the Hebrew date of your loved one's death. So the next slide, as you can see, it's very straightforward. It's the yard site or memorial candle. But it's created to honor a loved one's death. The candle is lit 24 hours prior to specific holidays or occasion. And lighting the candle symbolizes the act of remembrance. And there's a notion that the spirit of the deceased, uh, the spirit of the deceased fills the room again for 24 hours. So before we move on, I said something about holidays and occasion. You know that there are other holidays that we actually observe. The Yarsite, or we also use the word Yishkor, they overlap because Yishkor is a memorial service at set time. And we have those, as you may know, on Yom Kippur afternoon, the Yishkor. And we have um, the three Shloshim Regalim, the three pilgrimage holidays, uh, Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot, and also the, the day of your loved one's death. So we have more than one day that we are at to remember our loved ones. So the next slide would be the fact that people assume, because you know many of our rituals involve blessing, but there is actually no specific blessing when you light a yard. Okay. So I just want to share this beautiful um, um, prayer that came across, and it says, "Which is I find very um, moving." It says, Near Adonai Nishmat Adam, the, the human soul is the lamp of God from Proverbs 20, 27. We light this candle in a remembrance of you and we give thanks for knowing you. We, give, we light this candle and welcome your presence on this, your first um, your site, but this is something that you can do with you. Um, even as we deeply feel your absence. We light this candle to honor your memory. May your memory be a source of comfort, blessing, and light. Again, you can do whatever moves you, if you, whatever you want to say, but often um, it's always nice to have a prayer that might be um, something to have in front of you. So again, as I said, there are other um, optional prayers and this is something that Estelle shared with us and it says, I remember you, I will remember your life and what it felt like to be in your presence. May the spirit of the universe help protect the memory of you so the world may know your legacy. I feel the love that bound us in this world. I bask in its warmth and share love with others in your honor. May the spirit of the universe bond its love with yours and strengthen the fabric of life. The memory of you brings me peace, even though my heart aches missing you. I am blessed to have known you, and your memory will forever be a blessing. May the spirit of the universe grant your soul peace. So I've shared a little bit about um, traditional uh, the contemporary prayers, but there is more, as you have heard, yes, we will go to the next page where we will, um, the, the El Malay Wakamim, which is often, this is a prayer that we tr traditionally do at the funeral. However, it is also uh, a possible prayer that is said at a yard site. And I think it's interesting that this, prayer originated in the Jewish communities of Western and Eastern Europe, where it was recited for the martyrs of the Crusades and of the Kamelniki Mashkams, um, where there were many um, horrific incidents happening in that time. And this prayer is like, it, it's a plea 
a request to, for the soul of the departed, so that this soul may be granted what it called Manuka Nekona, which means a proper rest. Um, and so that the fact that a soul is in gone eating, you know, the um, paradise. So they're saying that it does not guarantee that it will actually happen. So according to the tradition, as you heard Rabbi Mill talk about the different levels of, um, you know, of getting in, what's really important for all of us to know is that our focus is what we do in life what we do and how we make a difference in the world and how, how and based on our good deeds will determine where we will be. Now, this is not always the case for everybody. This is, uh, especially in Reform Judaism, there are different concepts of thinking of what that might mean. So with that being said, that's why as a, as a survivor or as a mourner, or as a member or a family friend of somebody who has just died. The mitzvah of giving tzedakah is considered, again, a good deed for what you've done so that when you die, you will be in a good place. So the next prayer, you've heard over and over, and most of us are aware of the mourner's kaddish. There's one thing you need to notice that I am, um, the Hebrew word is Kaddish Yitom, which literally means the orphan prayer. So when you lose both parents, you become an orphan. So a couple of uh, facts about this. They say that, as you know, that it was, it's written in Aramaic, and which was the spoken language of most Jews from the 5th century BCE until the 5th century CE. And it was recited not only by priests, but by common folk as well. So you may know, if you're familiar with the Lord's Prayer, the Lord's Prayer is the Christian analog to the Kaddish. It is based on the verses from the Gospel of Matthew. It was written around the same time, the Lord's Prayer and the Kaddish. They both extol God's strength and ask for the establishment of God's sovereignty on earth. The Kaddish and the Lord's Prayer are also used in much the same ways. They're recited at most services and actually pretty much all funerals. And they bind their respective faith communities with universally familiar words and rhythm. Another thing we should know about the card is that it did not originate in the synagogue, but in the house, in the study of the house of study, the Beit Midrash. So after a scholar would deliver a teaching, the student and the teachers would rise to praise God's name. In other words, anytime you leave the table where you're studying Torah, you must not leave until you do praise God. And then you can apply that, the fact that in the, the worship service, when you hear um, the Kachi Kaddish, the Mini Kaddish, or before the Torah service or after the Torah service, they are in reflection of what happened in the house of study. Because we go through certain different sections of the service. And when there's a break or when we make a transition going to another part of the worship service, the Kaddish comes in. Now, I'm not talking about Kaddish Yitom. Okay. But during a mourning period for a rabbi or a teacher, the students would gather to study in his honor, and his son, the son of the one whose who parent had died would be given the honor to lead the prayer. Mm. And then over time, reciting Kaddish would place studying as the tribute given to the scholar. Eventually, the custom extended to all mourners, not only the survivors of rabbis and leaders. By the 6th century, Kaddish was a part of the synagogue prayer. And during the 13th century, when the crusade threatened the Jewish communities of Europe, it became, the Kaddish became associated with loss and mourning. So that is the mourner's Kaddish. As you can briefly see, I don't know, you know, most of the time we do it in, in Hebrew, 
but I think it's important to take a look in the English. It, the focus of, you know, in the middle, talking about blessed be God's great name to all eternity and blessed, praised, honored, exalted, extolled, glorified, adored, and lauded with the name of the Holy Blessed One. Beyond all earthly words and songs of blessing, praise, and comfort, to which we say, Amen. So it sounds like he does not mention the person who has died. That's correct. The mortgage cottage is for us as mourners to praise God, to thank God for giving us a loved one who were able to live however short or long, but we have to thank God and express our gratitude. So that is the focus of the cottage we talk. So there we go to the next slide where um, Psalm 23, and again, we can say it's quite universal because we, we hear this prayer both in the Christian community and in the Jewish community. And it's, so, okay. So those are some of the traditional prayers that can be spoken at a um, judge site observant. And we also recognize that these are prayers that are being said at a Jewish school service and they do overlap but they are the traditional prayers that are being said on the next slide in the next few we have a couple of contemporary prayers non-traditional and a shift an opportunity for because sometimes um, the traditional prayer or Hebrew may, may not be something that you are comfortable with. And it's so important to provide other way to have assets to express your loss. So what I want to do is invite you to sit. Uh, we have, we actually have three of them. I just want to take a moment, rather than me reading them, I would like for you to read them yourself. And as we began in the beginning, you were given the opportunity to share whom you've lost and whom are your beloveds. And perhaps you can take the next few minutes to reflect on those whom you have lost. I invite you to read them to yourself. You can't bring back the dead. But you can live with them inside your feet and your hand, guiding your cooking, your dreaming, your words, singing melodies of comfort so sweetly you can say their names out loud. Name your children after them. Make movies about them. And wear their socks or pajamas or a necklace made of jade that they, that they got on a trip to, to Japan. You can't bring the dead, you can't bring back the dead, but you can ponder your regrets. Write them, I'm sorry letters, pray for forgiveness, and know that you might be one of those people who waited too long, shut maybe. You can put together an intricate photo college of them in all their ages and glory. When they were sleeping, when they were posing, hoping to smell them again, or sit in their lap. You can see them suddenly walking down the street, the same gait, same clothes, same bad haircut. You can hear the voice calling to someone. You can't bring back the dead, but you can look into the eyes of a mentor and know that your dead sister is looking back at you through her eyes saying, yes, it's me. You get another chance. Don't be afraid. You can eat that chopped liver as if your mom, as if mom is in the room saying, have the more, it's delicious. You can tend your plants as if her arms are your arms and your intuition is really hers. You can't bring them back. But you can learn the Torah 
passed down from generation to generation. You can't bring back the dead, but you can mourn their deaths at the hands of the state. Cry out until someone listened, or just keep crying out. You can write their names on your sidewalks, in the synagogue, in your poetry. Never forget those who died during the great pandemic or at the hands of white supremacist violence. Why had the press stopped telling the story about those who died and are still dying? You can't bring them back, but you can remember their lives, each individual's life. You can't bring them back, but you know, but you can know that you will join them someday and others will not be able to bring you back, no matter how much they howl or plead or bargain. You can't bring me back when I am called to the other side. But maybe someone will write a poem in my memory. There's one more. Please look at it. So there's one last, there's a few more um, slides, actually, um, the one with the, the next slide, um, I do want to, uh, the photo, I find it very powerful with this magnet. It's like the Kurdish, the Yotta anniversary of, of a death. It's a powerful magnet drawing a person back to the synagogue and back to the people with regular and incessant with them. Even those whose synagogue affiliations are slender make new contact on this memory hallowed day. Even in small communities where there is no regular minion and where the house of prayer is, it's closed the entire week. Even there, the doors of the synagogue are open and arrangements are made for a service to take place when a Jew has a yard site to observe. To be observant of the yard site is one of the honors that a person can pay to their departed parents. And it is duty that their heart, mind, and conscience by, bid them pay with scrupulous care. As the strain of yard site reverberate through their soul, they reawaken with indescribable pregnancy the faded memories of the years past. So we have another, um, there are more to read. I know we have a few more minutes and you've all been very gracious to hear us. And um, I, I, I invite you, if you'd like to reflect any closing thoughts or, you know, in terms of remembering our loved ones. I understand that there's a request for the poem. I believe I would, uh, we will certainly share some of these poems and send them out to you. The final slide, I think it's important to let you know that there is a um, beautiful um, video, again, that will be provided in the, in the YouTube. And one more, a, one more slide at the very end. And that's what I invite you to participate if you are comfortable to do this. You are remember four. And may you live on in those whose lives you touch and be remembered as a blessing. Amen. So I'm going to ask that um, we go to gallery. Uh, um, thank you. So, Rabbi Mills, do you have anything to add? Or we do want to invite if anyone would like to say or would like to um, do this ritual at the end in terms of what you, if, it, if there's anybody you would like for us to remember. If anyone wants to share um, what your site, I'm sorry, your site means to them, that last slide had some reflections of what other people thought, why it was an important custom, what it meant to them. So.
I did notice um, there wasn't mention of placing a stone of memory. So I don't know if Rabbi Dubo or um, Rabbi Mills, if you want to, uh, to um, talk about that ritual. Well, Rabbi Mills, we, we had a slide with the tombstone, with the stones on top of it in the middle of the... Um, so the idea is that we often describe God as the rock. And we want to believe that God is always with our loved ones. And so we invite people when they come to the cemetery to pick up a rock. And now it could be a rock from anywhere. And then you will put it on the tombstone so that it demonstrates your presence there and your um, faith in God's presence too. Because, because you may know we don't, in our tradition, we don't really embrace the concept of bringing flowers because they, 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 they're taken from the earth and they died, whereas the rock is always there. And that is the idea of that God is eternal. Um, it's been a lovely tradition in some families, especially uh, with children. They're asked to, um, they can like decorate or uh, paint little rocks uh, of their loved one. And then they all come to the cemetery and do that ritual so they can be more personal to, instead of just taking any rock. So that's my take on that. But I think the actual putting rocks is part of any time you visit a cemetery. And so the right. actual ritual of your site is to visit a cemetery. Then obviously when you visit the cemetery, we put rocks on the gravestone as a custom. I do know that this is a very, um, maybe a typical topic for a number of us. And um, I just... Um, I hope that this was something that you can learn and take with you so that when the time comes when you are in uh, when you are in a situation where you are in mourning or experiencing a loss, that you will be able to recognize some of the ritual that can be used for that difficult time. I see that someone has raised their hand. So Tiffany. I was just going to say that I thought that this was really helpful. Um, I recently just lost my mom, and I think that the hardest part is kind of trying to put words to, like, how you feel. So um, just by having just certain things that if you feel upset, you can read something, you know, it makes it to where you're not so overwhelmed with, like, the loss because you have something that you can connect to. So I was looking forward to this class just because of that. Um, alone, so I really appreciate that. Good. I just, I just, you know, some people teach that Judaism is so set in its ways, and what was nice is that the customs developed like what became much more known and what people do based on what helped people. So although saying the Mourner's Cottage kind of came out of the idea that we fast and you go to synagogue when you're fasting, and so then you say that was what resonated with people. So that's what people remember. And for most of us, the fasting part has been lost, but we still say the board is Kaddish. Before we end, by the way, I just want to acknowledge it's been truly an honor uh, to be in the presentation with my colleague, Rabbi Meod. Uh, Rabbi Meod and I were in Jerusalem together in 1987. So we go way back, and um, it's always nice to be uh, in, on the same platform with our colleagues. So thank you, Rabbi Mills. Uh, thank you, Rabbi Duba. It was wonderful to be able to teach with you. And so as we are wrapping up, I'm going to put into the chat a couple of things. One is if anybody would like to go to a two